Well, I think we are starting. Um, hello, everyone. Good, uh, good uh, morning, afternoon, evening, depending on where you are. We are uh, waiting a couple of minutes for the attendants to come in. They are, they are coming in massively right now. So let's wait a, a little bit of time. Okay, it looks like the the number is now stabilizing, so we will we will start. Hello, everybody. Uh, thank you for joining us in this webinar, which is part of the series dedicated by the Club of Rome to the 50th anniversary of the publication of the Limits to Growth. And I'm very happy to welcome you all, wherever you are, good morning, afternoon, or evening, depending on where. where is that. Uh, probably being the time it is, we don't have so many people from Asia, but I guess we have plenty of people from Africa, Europe, and the Americas. And of course, welcome in particular to Nora and, and, and Julia as main speakers, but we will have also some other speakers, some colleagues of the International Bateson Institute, Lance Strat, Philip Goudemi, and Jeff Bloom. And I am Carlos Alvarez Pereira. I'm the vice president of the Club of Rome, but I am also a good friend of Nora and member of the advisory board of the uh, IBI, of the International Bateson Institute. Let me just start by giving to all of you a bit of context of why we are having this webinar in this way and with these people. And it's about, as I said, we, this year 2022 is the 50th anniversary of the publication of, of this book, The Limits to Growth. What I'm showing is probably the latest edition of this book just published a few weeks ago in, uh, in Galician, which is, uh, which is Portuguese actually, uh, but that was published in Galicia, part, part of Spain, and which was the land of my father. So 50 years after, it's still a book which is now being published again, translated and published again. And I would like to bring to the fore the idea that the Club of Rome is now a space where many different threads are converging through its members, but especially through the conversations that we are having with many other people in a, as much as we can in a, in a warm way with many different schools of thought. And the convergence is, so some of these threads are, of course, a lot of what is happening in the Club of Rome could be considered as the legacy or the continuation of uh, what was started by the limits to growth 50 years ago and by, by that radical thinking and that radical questioning. Because the question that the limits to growth was asking was, in a way was, does prosperity lead to collapse or could prosperity, the way it, is, it was defined and the way it is still defined, could prosperity lead to collapse if we consider prosperity in terms of never ending uh, growth of material consumption? And that was of course a provocative question. And the book was uh, labeled as a doomsday prophecy. It was not, it was more of a, of a book to open the space of possibilities and to consider different ways of relating uh, to other people and to the planet, to the biosphere. But it was discarded as that, as a doomsday prophecy and mostly ignored. So a lot of what is going on in the Club of Rome today is sort of a continuation of that critical work and that critical questioning. And, um, and for instance, we published uh, these year two books on occasion of this 50th anniversary. One, Earth for All is mostly about trying to bring the responses 
to that question, uh, could uh, prosperity, could we balance material prosperity with the health of the biosphere? And one of our co-presidents, uh, Sandrine dixon de Clave, is very active in, in, in pushing the, the message and the responses around that question. And we also published, I was co-editor of that book and uh, both Nora and Julia contributed to Limits and Beyond, which was a more open conversation about what did limits, the limits to growth mean, the time they were published, what happened since then and where are we now and how do we look into the, into the future and how do we, to use my own expression, how do we learn what we already know? But there is another uh, thread which is also present in the in the Club of Rome, which is, let's say, the legacy, but also the the present activity of self liberation movements. The other co-president of the Club of Rome, Mampella Rampele, started at the same time that the Club of Rome was created. Started with a few others, uh, including notably Steve Biko, uh, the Black Consciousness Movement in South Africa. So that idea that we can liberate ourselves is also very much present, as well as the activities of more action-oriented practitioners by people like uh, Julia Kim in her work in Bhutan, like John Gilmore in South Africa, and Didi Noli Edozian in, in Nigeria, or, or even business leaders like Emmanuel Faber or Peter Bloom. And Last but not least, of course, definitely but not least, another thread which is very much present in the Club of Rome today is the thread coming with from this wide area of thinking that we call system thinking, which is in itself very complex and very rich. And there are many different schools of thought in that system thinking area, of which we have the pleasure of having in the club and also with us today, uh, the representative of a very strong school of thought, but I'm biased because I'm fan. Uh, we have uh, Nora Bateson and the Batesonian thinking. And this webinar takes place especially because it's also the 50th anniversary of another book, of the publication of another book, this one, uh, by her father, Gregory Bateson, Steps to an Ecology of Mind, a fascinating collection of essays, which I highly recommend, uh, not easy reading, but it opens minds and it opens, definitely opens the space of possibilities. So this is the context in which we are weaving different threads in a warm and safe space of conversation and stop talking because actually I want more to listen and, and start listening to our dear uh, colleagues, uh, ladies, Nora and Julia, so please, Nora, go ahead. You are, you are on mute, Nora. Thank you, Carlos. And um, it's nice to see you, Julia. Uh, I, um, I am excited about bringing these two pieces together. I mean, you got to kind of wonder what was going on in 1972 that these were the type of publications that were coming out and, and that there was, it feels to me, there was this sort of opening um, in a cultural way for there to be um, a new batch of ideas. Um, but obviously it's taken a very long time to begin to really bring those ideas into our daily life and we're still working on how they might change the patterns of life. Uh, so um, I have been really interested in um, this question of systems change. What does what does that mean? You know it's it's altogether too easy to say those words. Um, but but what does that mean? How does that kind of depth of change affect you know what you eat and how you think about your identity and how you think about what it is to be attractive or how you raise your children or 
how you eat breakfast or how you think about health or, you know, all of these things. What is beauty? What, you, you know, all of these things are deeply wrapped into the same questions that come up in other scales as uh, global policies and, and protocols for um, changes in the way that we perceive and live in the world so that hopefully uh, there might be less destruction. But I don't see that systems change is something that lives in the level of policy alone. And so for me, the question um, is really deeply rooted in uh, not only how do we make community and how do we organize community, but what what is the communing that's necessary so that those communities and collaborations um, don't become fodder for um, just more bickering and and divisiveness. So I, I think there's um, some some really interesting, deep rooted little nuts that are deep, deep in our um, industrial thinking. And uh, I have found that there are ways in which it's it's tempting and and <clears throat> seductive even to think about change that could be measured, that could be identified, that could be modeled, that could be implemented, that we could put in at a state level. But in doing so, there's liable to be real pushback from the bottom, from the, from the daily lives of people who um, see things very differently and don't want to be told how to live. So um, this is not an insignificant issue. So how do we begin to think about these things that are so deeply in, in our epistemologies, um, which is what I think my father was getting at in Steps to an Ecology of Mind is not just, um, not just ecology, but an ecology of ideas and how these ideas reflect off each other and through each other into how we perceive the world and ourselves and each other in it. So I'll start there. And what do you think, Julia? <laughs> Thank you, Nora. It's such a pleasure to be in conversation with you. And, um, you know, uh, my first encounter with some of the thinking of uh, your father and the Institute really came through our conversations with the Club of Rome and then watching the documentary and then becoming intrigued with this question of how do we know, you know, what are the different ways of knowing? Um, and for myself, when I think about systems change. I know that there's a tendency in myself, I notice a lot to think that the system is something out there. And I'm this agent who's going to change the system. And I love how you talk about, you know, the metaphor you've used before about the antlers on a deer and, and where, where does the deer begin? And, and I think that's so re relevant when we think of where does the system begin? And, and are we a part of it? And it becomes important when we think about systems change to see all the different ways we relate to the system and, and, and not think about it as something that we can exert in a uh, effort or activity in a certain area and expect a certain result in a, in a kind of mechanical way. So for me, this journey has been one of kind of um, becoming more aware of my own patterns of thinking and how my own education and profession has shaped that. Um, I'm, I'm, I would say I started out leaning very heavy towards the quantitative and scientific. I was trained as a medical doctor. I almost went into uh, genetic research with a, a nod to your grandfather who coined the phrase genetics. That was one direction I was going to be going and then started moving more to public health. and. Um, I think, as I was telling you earlier, uh, very much initially thinking about the policy change coming top down, we implement certain policies and practices, and then we expect it to unfold in this way in a, in a community. And as soon as I had the opportunity to actually be in a community as a young 
HIV researcher in rural South Africa, I realized that it was much more complex than I could have anticipated. And many of the interventions that were kind of um, envisioned uh, at the top just did not unfold in that way once you, once you were in a rural community. But what happened is that as I started to let go of the need to control the process and opened up to, uh, in this case, it was rural women. We were tackling issues around gender, uh, women's empowerment, poverty, HIV risk, so pretty heavy issues. They would come up with practices and solutions that I could not have dreamed of. And at first it was a bit of a panic. How am I gonna explain this to the funders? And then I realized what they were coming up with was so much more exciting and innovative than what we could have uh, come up, what we would dreamt up with. Um, and so it became a process of documenting what was happening and trying to move with the flow. So, so I would say that was the beginning of my curiosity about how change happens and what is my role in it and how do I use my expertise but not impose it on the system. And it's actually more akin to the other field, which I feel um, is, is my stage of practice, which is as a musician. I play the violin. I'm most happy when I'm improvising. And that has forced me to have to pay attention to the space between the notes, to not anticipate what's the next phrase I'm going to play, but actually listen in to what's happening and be able to respond to that. So I, I come to this conversation interested also in how do we cultivate the capacity to do these these different ways of uh, engaging and almost dancing with complexity um, to maybe reflect a phrase that Danella Meadows would have used. So that's just some responses and reflections from my side, Nora. Yeah, I love that. And I think there's a lot that can be learned from your example um, around working with um, the women in, in the HIV story that you were just telling and uh the the unimaginable interconnections and relationships between processes uh, uh, defy the linear strategy and and what the what the what the model can hold you know the the problem um with a lot of models is that they have to be reduced to the, the complexity on the ground, I'm looking at, you know, Lance has the map is not the territory. The territory has to be reduced to fit into the model. And who's doing the reducing? And if that reducing is happening um, at, a, at a distance, it's going to be very difficult to know where those, those reductions have even taken place, let alone what the consequences might be. So I think that's really beautiful. I put together um, uh, a few months back, I put together a little video um, that that uh, is a sort of exploration of this idea of limits to growth um, through a kind of uh, Bateson lens, if you will. Um, and uh, we have it on hand as a sort of a starting place to bring in a couple of, of stories and examples uh, just to think about limits to growth um, in another sort of way. Uh, so maybe this is a good time to play that video and then we can talk about it. I if think it's an excellent moment to do that, Nora. So good. please, if we could have uh, Rad or Bonolo, if we could have the video now, that would be great. And just a word of warning to everybody out there, it runs 13 minutes, so sit tight and there's lots in it. In a world that's thinking about life in industrial ways, notions of growth, of development, of optimization, of bettering, of becoming more efficient, of more, faster, uh, would appear to be worth striving for. And um, over the last several hundred years, that's certainly been the, the underlying premises of 
everything from the factory to school to um, health to mental health to uh, agriculture to in every way there has been this transcontextual effort to make more better faster uh, and what could go wrong well I think what could go wrong is pretty much everything that we are seeing as our global crises at this time uh, and so I wanted to just address this from a couple of different directions um, just to kind of stir the conversation in another way and what I want to do is to tell you two stories and one of them is kind of a just a, a re remembering uh, uh, of what we mean when we're talking about ecology. What is ecology? Because these, this is a word that gets thrown around. Um, and, and it's easy to get lost in the depths of these kind of mechanistic metaphors and have ecology, you know, a forest, starts to become organisms that are in some sort of functional relationship and it's like a, a kind of a, a watch, a Swiss watch, and every organism does its part. Um, and what I'd like to do is to back away from that um, kind of unspoken set of assumptions around ecology. And, and my dad, Gregory Bateson, used to talk about uh, this definition of ecology he had where he talked about the deer's antlers. And the deer's antlers, you can say, uh, are there to defend, for defense, or for, <coughs> for the possibility of aggression. Um, he can get in a fight with other male deer, or he can um, throw, push to the side a mountain lion or something. And the deer's antlers are also there to attract the female deer. So they're there for procreation for the continuation of the species. But this is where we usually stop. And if you start to look at the other things that go on with the deer's antlers, you start to see ecology in a much more multi-purposed um, and, and uh, interdependent way. So. The, the deer's antlers, our home in the velvet of the deer's antlers is where the antler flies breed. And the, when the deer's antlers fall to the forest floor, they become home and they become food to all sorts of organisms. And when the deer's antlers begin to uh, rot and decompose, or they get eaten by those organisms, those organisms poop and the, that, that mineral content goes into the soil and feeds the bacteria into which the, the environment that the deer requires for survival is nourished. Um, and so I, I'd like to just point to this for a second and invite you to look at this not as a set of interconnections but to ask even the question where's the edge of the deer is the edge of the deer in the trees is it in the soil is it in the rodents and the small organisms that live on the forest floor where's the edge of the deer and that's just one part of the deer that is already in relationship to so many other organisms okay so what I want to address there is this way of looking at ecology as millions of organisms shaping each other. Millions of organisms shaping each other. And I think that this is an important uh, idea to bring into this idea of growth. Because what happens when a human being gets an idea that one particular aspect of a particular organism should be developed or grown or made more efficient for a particular singular purpose. 
And it's that singular purposiveness that is so wildly out of sync with how ecological processes work. Um, there's this fantastic example that uh, my dad wrote about in Mind and Nature. And it's the example of the polyploid horse. And the polyploid horse was this horse that was a, a cart horse that was genetically altered to be twice the size of a normal cart horse. And this guy who did this um, uh, modification, um, his name was Possiv, and it seemed like it was going to be a good idea, right? If, if a cart horse, if a, the Clydesdale cart horse, you know, is good because it's big and it's fast and it's strong, then let's make it bigger, faster, and stronger. And when they did that, they actually, he, I think he got a Nobel Prize for it, but he, it was a disaster. That poor creature um, couldn't stand up, it needed, it's, it's, it couldn't keep itself cool, its metabolism to be twice as big had to have four times as much food. It, 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 in every way, the poor creature um, was unable to stand, unable to interact with other organisms, it couldn't reach its food, it couldn't get enough food. Um, And so we have to ask the question, because what you see in this polyploid horse is a kind of Frankenstein. It's a sort of disaster of ingenuity, of what happens when one purpose is pulled out and made the desirable one to develop. Now, in, in the end of where my father is talking about this polyploid horse in Mind and Nature, he, he asks this question, he brings this in, and I just want to read you this, okay? He says, Among some higher animals, growth is controlled. The creature reaches a size of age or stage at which growth pr simply stops, i.e. is stopped by chemical or other messages within the organization of the creature. The cells under control cease to grow and divide. When controls no longer operate by failure to generate the message or failure to receive it, the result is cancer or other destruction. So this is the key piece I want to bring in, is this question here. Where do such messages originate? What triggers their sending? And in what presumably chemical code are these messages imminent? What controls the nearly perfect external bilateral symmetry of the mammalian body? We have remarkably little knowledge of the message system that controls growth. There must be a whole interlocking system, as yet scarcely studied. Um, you know, the gist of what he's getting at here is that I, as a human being, am the, the sort of sizes and shapes that I am because I am shaped by millions of other organisms. Imagine if that delimitation, those messages weren't met and the microbacteria in my gut grew to be the size of grapefruits. I would die. Um, when you go to the store and you reach for that biggest, juiciest apple, I invite you to keep in mind the Frankenstein that that apple is. And to remember that the little apple that the didn't grow very big is the one that is actually in communication and relationship with the other ecological processes and organisms around it. Um, so what is it in us when we talk about limits to growth or the benefits of development? There are presuppositions lurking in the notions that development is good and that we have to limit growth. 
I would suggest that neither one of those is actually worthy of much thought um, uh, in terms of how to do more of them, right? Because then again, we get if, if limits to growth are good, we should have more limits to growth. <laughs> and, and in fact, the question is, what are those millions of messages and those processes that we are involved with, with in so many directions, like the antlers, uh, that would allow us to be in, uh, in mutual learning and vitality with the world that we live in. Uh, this way of describing is, I think, closely related to Charles Saunders Peirce's um, description of what he called abductive process. And my dad talked about abductive process too, and it's a, you know, it takes a little while to get used to the idea. But the, the, the concept is that all the different contexts and organisms are in a sense descriptions of each other. So the antler flies are a description of the, the, the antler, of the deer. The bacteria is also a description of the deer. It's a description of the, the rodents that ate from the deer. The rodents are a description of the bacteria and the deer, that all the organisms in an ecological process or a society, the ideas in a society become descriptions of each other. So that when you think we gotta make the education system better, but the education system isn't in the education system. The education system is a description of the economy. It's a description of the health system, a description of the political system, a description of the family, of history, of technology. Just like the antlers are a description of the forest. So let's think about it from that direction and see what happens. Thanks. Wow. <laughs> Uh, thank you so much, uh, Nora, for recording this video. Uh, so, so full of of good provocations, I would say, including that provocation on uh, what about the paradox of the growth of limits to growth? Uh, if the limits to growth are good, we want more limits to growth, right? Um, Julia, any any reaction uh, on to the to the video to what was said? I've I've seen the video more than once, and each time I think I hear something different in it. Uh, there are lots of different layers to it. This this time when I was listening in, I was really connecting to this question of, um, you know, what are the messages that circle back to give kind of feedback on growth. When, when does the apple know it's big enough? What, what, are, what are the natural messages? And, um, you know, when I think about some of the work that, uh, some of the thinking that comes out of the limits to growth, particularly as it relates to the economy and economic growth and GDP growth, to what extent are we um, constantly buying into the message, as Nora put it, of bigger, faster, stronger, more is always better. And where is a sense of um, flourishing and, and, and well-being and happiness? Is that part of that at all? And I think it's, it's a really important question, not, not only at a systems level, but as a, at a personal level, at an individual level, to try to tune into what are the signals and signs of enoughness and to what extent are we constantly being fed messages of not enoughness? You're not beautiful enough, not thin enough, not tall enough, not rich enough, not fit enough, not young enough. I mean, you could add in many other things in there. Um, and a constant, what we talk, we've, I've heard is called FOMO, fear of missing out. And that mindset is, is very much uh, part of our chasing of more and more growth, which has, I think, led to some of the devastation that we're seeing on the planet at the moment. So at the same time that it's a systems 
issue and question. It's also an individual and personal question. And, and, and I don't think there's a clear answer to it, but raising that question as something to be aware of, I think is really important as we think about what next, how do we, how do we reorient towards something that's more whole and more life-giving. I think about the, the movements towards well-being economies which you talk about a little bit in the book, Limits and Beyond, is a way of trying to bring into our consciousness the other aspects of life beyond economic or GDP growth that give meaning. And many of them are the intangible things, the, the, the spaces between people, uh, things like time, time use as being important, closeness of communities, appreciating uh, um, appreciating uh, closeness and, and connection. These are things that are important to our sense of well-being, but are not really thought of as a part of economic development. They're often a casualty of economic development when it's measured very narrowly. So I'm, I'm really resonating with uh, what Nora was sharing. And it, it seems to come to me at many different levels. Um, I find the metaphors really, really powerful, the deer's antlers, the apple, and just the, the image of Nora in the forest. I wanted to add one more thought, which is coming back to what I was saying earlier about the idea that the, the solutions come kind of top down and can be implemented without a attention to a context. I think there's also a kind of um, corollary to that, which is when something is successful in a local context, amidst a certain group of people in relationship, then we need to scale it up in exactly the same way. It's back to that factory thinking, that mechanical thinking. And where I think the movement towards well-being economies is exciting is that I think there's openness for adaptation and experimentation. There is a, a question and a principle that um, we don't just pursue economic growth, material growth for its own sake, but how we figure out how to get towards flourishing and well-being needs to be co-created in relationship with others and paying attention to what are the consequences of the choices and actions we make. So maybe just to, to close with those reflections, but I'm always so struck by the video and, and, and the different angles uh, that it brings up for me. Thank you, Julia. I cannot help weaving together some of the comments and questions which have been put on the chat. Uh, the exchange in the, in the chat is quite rich. And, and some questions and reflections came out. Several of them are related to, actually related to Donella Meadows, who, um, uh, as you know, uh, was the leading author of the Limits to Growth, and many people have been following her works and her thinking, which evolved quite a lot from the limits to growth in 1972 to the idea of leverage points, to the idea of dancing with systems, which was the title of her last article that you mentioned, uh, you evoked, uh, Julia. So many people are tempted by the question, but then what are the points? What are the, then the points to intervene in a system which uh, is still, you know, in the process of observing as if we were external observers of the system? And is that the mindset, our own mindsets? And, and what about that? And I cannot help also mentioning that a few years after the limits to growth, the Club of Rome published. Uh, another book that nobody almost nobody knows about which was titled no limits to learning and we we reclaim very much that approach of learning learning as living because nora says rightly that there is no difference between living and learning so before we give the floor to our colleagues of the ibi uh, nora maybe a reflection from your side I think that um, one thing to always keep in mind is that no matter what you do, you are responding. 
So doing nothing is a response um, and Indeed. responding is a response. So this idea, what shall we do to the system um, needs to be brought back in through that, that recognition that no matter what you're doing, you're in it and, and you're, there, there is a relationship, there is change, there is movement, there is response to response to response to response to response. And this is systemic process. What gives me pause is the, 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 the ease with which we can forget that creating a first order response, right? I'm gonna push this, it's gonna make a noise that that is something that happened. And we can look at it, measure it, label it, name it. But when we're working with systemic process, that first thing is then going to, like the antlers, be a response that goes in multiple directions that creates multiple responses to multiple responses to multiple responses. This nth order change issue. And this is the difficulty, is that systemic change is not first order change, it's nth order change. And that means that it's very difficult to um, know what you're creating when you think you're acting at or to or on a system. And, and that basically everything you're doing in the system is already having shifts in multiple directions. So I'll, I'll, I'll open it there and, and see where it goes. Um, so you just want to say anything, go ahead. What, what, uh, what from our friends of our IBI friends, Jeff, Lance, Philip, who wants to intervene? Don't be, don't be shy. It's always difficult to say something after Nora, but, um, Philip? Well, I can always um, follow Nora with Gregory and especially with the last pages of Steps to an Ecology of Mind because they are astonishingly relevant to the whole problematic that uh, we face as a species, as uh, people here and specifically the Club of Rome and other people who have been engaged in thinking about these things for so many decades. <laughs> So uh, two things, uh, one thing he asks, is it important that the right things be done for the right reasons? Is it necessary that those who revise and carry out plans should understand the ecological insights which guided the planners? Or should the original planners put into the very fabric of their plan collateral incentives, which will seduce those who come later into carrying out the plans? And then several paragraphs later. In fact, the problem of how to transmit our ecological reasoning to those to whom we wish to influence in what seems to us to be an ecologically good direction is itself an ecological problem. We are not outside the ecology for which we plan. We are always and inevitably a part of it. Herein lies the charm and the terror of ecology, that the ideas of this science are irreversibly becoming a part of our own eco-social system. We live then in a world different from that of the mountain lion. He or she is neither bothered nor blessed by having ideas about ecology, we are. And skipping a little, if this estimate is correct, then the ecological ideas implicit in our plans are more important than the plans themselves. And it would be foolish to sacrifice these ideas on the ide altar of pragmatism. It will not in the long run pay to sell the plans by superficial ad hominem arguments which will conceal or contradict the deeper insight. So here he is really saying something rather hard. He is saying that not only doing the right things, uh, but things that are maybe branded as ecological, but understanding ecological uh, ways of thinking and principles at a deeper level 
and understanding our predicament as a, at a deeper level is necessary for us at this time. I'll start there. Thank you, Philip. Well, I, yeah, I could um, pick up on you know the really important question of changing the way that we think, and uh, you know the Nor and and others references to kind of mechanistic industrial thinking and a kind of linear thinking, and you know so Gregory Bateson represents uh, an important contribution to trying to change this mode of thinking. Uh, and, you know, I think it's part of a larger context that we have to see. It's sort of interesting, 1972, we tend to symbolically fixate on a particular date, like, you know, 1492 or, or 1776. But when we really look into things there, you know, it's a longstanding process, not a singular, uh, in, you know, inflection point. And, and I would, point uh, to some others as well, uh, including Alfred Korzybski much earlier in, in the century, uh, who really is trying to work out new modes of thinking that are non-linear and relational and ecological in, in their approach, and, and others like Lewis Mumford and Marshall McLuhan, who are seeing the roots of this in our technology, in our technological structure. It's not an accident that we're referring to this wrong mode of thinking as mechanistic that is based it, it's what Mumford called the ideology of the machine uh and uh industrial uh you know and, and interestingly coming at a time when uh you know at least the criticism starts in the mid 20th century where we start talking about being in a post-industrial uh society and you know also point to the German sociologist Niklas Luhmann who uh, used a systems approach to talk about society. Society is a social system. Its parts are made up of acts of communication. And so when we change the way that we communicate, we're changing the very nature of the system. Uh, Jacques Ellul, who talked about the, uh, the dominance of technical thinking, technological thinking. Uh, I also mentor, mentioned my mentor, Neil Postman, who was very much trying to criticize and warn us about the effects of, of technological innovation. Uh, and, uh, you know, so when we look at things, I, mean, I think part of the problem is the metaphor of systems itself, though, which is what Nora was getting at. I mean, systems imply a kind of circle with a boundary, and we become fixed on that, on that metaphor, where it really in, in our time we've uh, encountered a new kind of metaphor that I think we need to explore more fully of the network. You know, the story of the of the deer is about a story of a network of relations where there is no end boundary. And I think that's very much in keeping with Gregory Bateson's view. There are just things that are further out from the kind of center or core of the network and things that are <clears throat> closer to it. Uh, and, and all of this really connects to a kind of electronic, if you like, uh, metaphor that's more in keeping with an ecological view. It's one that is non-linear and, and also non-additive. The story of the polyploid ho horse, I mean, it harkens back to uh, the idea that if you want to relieve traffic congestion, you won't do it by building more highways and roads. It's something that Robert Moses found out long ago in New York City, uh, which was why Lewis Mumford opposed him uh, you know, so stridently because building the Cross Bronx Expressway just added to traffic congestion and destroyed that part of New York City by dividing it artificially in half. And the bottom line, and, and this is very much the media ecology uh, approach, the field of media ecology that Neil Postman uh, gave a name to, is that when you introduce a change into a system, you don't, it's not additive, you don't just get the system plus something new, because the system's composed of interdependent parts, you change one thing, that changes something else, and that changes something else, and it ripples throughout the system till you get some an entirely new system, or the system collapses. And we can't predict what's going to happen. So we're constantly adding new 
uh, innovations to our systems, not knowing what the ultimate result is going to be. And of course, each time it comes out and it's like, well, we survived that, we're okay. That seems to reinforce the idea of adding new things to the system, but it only takes one time for the system to collapse and then it's it's all over. Uh, so, I mean, this really suggests that we should be proceeding with caution, uh, but it's very hard to do that. But I think it, you know, it does go back to, to Nora's ultimate point uh, against the mechanistic uh, industrial linear way of thinking of higher hierarchies moving top down, a networked approach, you know, referring particularly to the distributed and decentralized networks that we associate with the Internet is the bottom up approach and there's no way around that because if you don't get the bottom if you don't get the foundation then what are you doing you're building castles in the in the in the air ultimately that are going to collapse yeah thank you so much lance i'm i i would like to give the floor to jeff but with a maybe with a provocation uh, directly to you, because we are talking about changing the way we think. Uh, it might look, we all have to undergo masters and PhD in, in deep uh, system thinking around the concepts which have been evoked. At the same time, uh, we know that the lot of what we are talking about is in a way to come back. I mean, human cultures, the, the, the relationality, the perception of relationality is not at all absent from human cultures. That's where we started, right? And it is very obvious when you look at uh, present day uh, indigenous cultures, which are still alive, and, and we've mentioned many times in the conversations in the Club of Rome about Ubuntu and other African worldviews, but also Asian worldviews, where relationality is much more at the core. And at the same time, the question is, uh, is these, these other ways of thinking something we have to teach to kids? And you know where I'm. You know where I'm going with this question to you, Jeff, mm -hmm. about uh, actually our natural capacity, the natural capacity of kids, to think in a systemic and relational way. Uh, could you could you say something about that, please? Sure. Um, that wasn't at all what I was thinking about talking about, but I think it's even better than what I was intending to do. Um, yeah, I, I started out in biology and uh, and pretty quickly, for some odd reason, switched over to teaching and uh, and then it, that grew out into, you know, a, a, just a fascination with children's thinking and how they made sense of things and how they talked. <clears throat> and and they really uh, it's kind of a natural propensity that I saw of children to think systemically. And I didn't see that, you know, like immediate, it wasn't like a flash of insight, but it was something that percolated over, over many years of, of kind of getting that into my own head of, of how learning uh, sort of manifests in children. And it's certainly not reflected in the way we teach uh, which is kind of the opposite of systemic thinking. Uh, so you get children looking at something. I mean, what, an early study I did as an academic was looking at children uh, playing with earthworms and interviewing them, talking, and uh, you know, just sort of very informal kind of uh, setting with the kids. And every one of them thought transcontextually. I mean, it was just built in. They'd be looking at and and with all kinds of things happening uh, in their minds. They they'd be talking about 
how the earthworm is uh, moving and digging and and uh, squishing and you know together and you know stretching out. And then all of a sudden they were talking about fishing with their grandfather who knew a lot about fishing and uh, they would just go off in all kinds of directions. Uh, one little uh, girl is like, oh, oh, it's really ugly. And, you know, three minutes later, she's saying, oh, he's so cute. Look how, you know, soft he is. Uh, and it, it would just bring in all kinds of emotions and aesthetic kind of, uh, uh, you know, ideas or, or feelings about what they were they were talking about. And you know, some one one particular boy is talking about. Well, I wonder what it feels like to be an earthworm. It must be dark and lonely, and that's a lot of like how I feel. And I mean, just went into this really uh, amazingly uh, personal connection with the earthworm and life as an earthworm and life as and his own life. Um, and this is just, you know, to Every, every child that I, I talked to like this uh, thought in these ways when they were younger. I mean, we're talking about, you know, six, seven, eight, up to maybe age uh, 12 or so. Uh, and the more they go through school, the further they move away from this kind of thinking because it isn't uh, encouraged. In fact, it's put down usually uh, divergent ideas. Now, now, let's go back to topic. The teacher will always bring. Let's get back to the topic and cut off children as they diverge, which is where all the interesting stuff is. And it's a shame that that we, you know, we've set up an educational system that is linear, mechanistic. All of these things that we've talked about. Uh, uh, here, and we 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 move uh, we move children away from thinking like that. We're all the result of that. I mean, I catch myself just falling back into linear ways of thinking all the time, and I got to you know slap myself and sort of you know, get back uh, and loosen up a little bit. So you know that's it's it's pretty uh, bleak. There are exceptions to this. There are uh, schools that we've looked at, Reggio Emilia uh, approaches to, to teaching where this is really encouraged. I mean, you, you follow the children and you get glimmers of hope uh, in regular public schools with individual teachers. But for the most part, you know, it's this uh, very intentional approach, linear approach to, to education that, uh, we're seeing the, the, the results of. I want to throw in a little story that it's kind of, maybe we can make a connection to this. But uh, when I was in grad school in biology, I was helping out one of my fellow students uh, for his research, thesis research. And he was looking at, and this is bringing in population growth, uh, looking at a um, population of pigeons living in a, an abandoned uh, lighthouse. And we would have to go in every, uh, every week or, or so, and we'd have to get dressed up because it was like, uh, you know, maybe a meter deep in pigeon poop, which was lethal. The, the pathogens that lived in this, uh, <laughs> this lighthouse, they had all kinds of warning signs, do not, come in here, you know, big, uh, you know, X's and, and skulls. Um, and so we get all masked up and dressed up and go in and, and count uh, pigeon eggs. And what he discovered was that the pigeons monitor their population. And I don't know that most animals do this, but, uh, this may be pigeons. And if the population was growing too big, they would abandon nests. And if it was uh, shrinking, they would 
sit on those eggs and take care of those eggs and, and the chicks. Um, and, and that's the way they, in their little population, controlled population growth. It was intentional. I'm not saying that people need to abandon their babies, uh, but, uh, but there's something about the way uh, the extremely complex system that we live in uh, takes care of itself. So, you know, one of the, the things that uh, we, uh, we need to consider is that even though our population growth is, is out of control, whatever control means, it will be regulated one way or the other. And, and we've seen hints of that with our uh, pandemics and natural disasters and all sorts of things. Uh, or we can uh, think about how we, we approach, which is the point, I guess, here of, of how, we, how we deal with population growth, but it can't, it can't be in this linear mechanistic way. We have to tell, it didn't work. China tried, <laughs> uh, that didn't work too well, limit everybody to one baby. Um, but maybe there's a, a more organic way to do this, uh, to plant some seeds and not that we can cultivate and expect the seeds to grow in the way we think, but it has to be something that's connected to people's emotions and values and aesthetics and, uh, beliefs and uh, and just the way we 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 think. Uh, Good. And how do we bring and how do we, how do we bring you know systems thinking and encourage systems thinking in a natural way with children rather than uh, you know a lot of approaches that where systems thinking is taught it's becomes then a, a mechanistic linear conscious purpose endeavor which yeah almost always right. back thank you yeah. where the system's over there so let's right. learn about the system yeah. right and rather that, than, rather yeah. than be inside it yeah. yeah uh nora i cannot help uh we are getting closer to the end of this webinar but we have still some minutes uh cannot help bringing to your attention a question by our dear friend and colleague Mampela Rampele, she says to you, could we, hear, could we hear more about our relationships with time that belies the inextricable linkages of ecosystems across time and space? Mm -hmm. uh, I'm a bit guilty in a way because I've been saying that we have uh, our relation, relationality, uh, rethinking, changing the way we think has to be about our relationships with people, with living beings and with time. Mm -hmm. So what could you say about that? I mean, I could say an awful lot more than 10 minutes can hold. I know, I know, of <laughs> course. <laughs> but, I, you know, uh, just a few things. One is that it was interesting in the pandemic because uh, everybody's relation in, in lockdown, our relationship with time was getting shifted. Um, I, I sometimes liken it to the experience of you know, when you pull a foam mattress out of the packaging the first time and it kind of expands in the air and then there's no way you can put it back in that box. And that's a little bit what happened in the pandemic that that time kind of got unpacked and it filled with this other air and it won't go back in the structure that we were living in before. It just won't squish in there. Um, but But what's interesting to me about this is that absolutely everything moves through time so you know our relationship to food our relationship to sleep our relationship to the seasons our relationship to um you know music and pacing julia was talking about about music um our relationship to birth and death and age and love and and 
when you get up in the morning to do something and how often you visit people. So there's that piece. Change your relationship to time and you change everything. It all moves through there. Um, and then there's this other thing, which is that very often when we get um, an idea about what the future is going to be or what the past was, that, that the tendency is to flatten the potential complexity of that perception. Because as you cast into the future, um, the, the utopia that you might perceive there is missing a lot of detail, all sorts of crazy possibilities that the, the complexity of the moment brings. Um, and, and likewise with the past, you know, we can get caught in all kinds of nostalgia. So in terms of our relationship also with ecosystems, they are not still. And it's altogether too easy to draw a model of an ecosystem that doesn't hold the time, that doesn't show the learning, that doesn't reveal the way, you know, some organism, three relationships out, makes a sudden shift. And, and, and that staticness um, can be very seductive because it gives us the, the, the feeling, you know, when, when I push a button on my computer, I push it and something happens. When I drive my car, I'm doing the thing and something happens. And I feel that. But when I'm in, an, in, a, in a more ecological relationship with something, I have to actually be careful, right? I might wake up in the morning to my children, you know, essentially banging on my head at six o'clock in the morning saying, wake up, wake up. And I might think, oh, why did I have children? What was I thinking? But I would never say that. Why would I never say that? I would never say that because if I said that, the way that that saying could actually in time grow and become and seep into other generations and other experiences and other forms of hurt, I would be bringing something into an ecology that in time could move in many different directions. So I wouldn't say that. And I would be thinking, oh, I have the right to speak my mind, but do I? Or do I have a responsibility for caring for that ecology of communication and how um, how how it comes to be? Because as as Lance, you know, has just said, time is not linear. Right. And the way that I am with my children is teaching me things about my grandparents and they're long gone. So the way in which mutual learning happens in time is absolutely nonlinear. Um, yeah. What do you think, Julia? What about time? Yeah, Julia, I mean, just talking about time, sorry to be the bad guy here. Uh, so we are now really getting close to, so just before a few words of closing from my side, Julia, uh, what, what would you like to share with us? Oh, this is such a profound topic, but I think so relevant. Um, you know, maybe I'll speak a little bit from the Eastern or Asian point of view and specifically from a Buddhist tradition where there is, uh, a kind of understanding that time as we know it doesn't actually exist. And we may have fleeting experiences of that, of timeless awareness, timeless awareness of presence. Uh, and they're fleeting. And therefore, the, the practices of meditation and so on to be able to cultivate the capacity to sustain that. Why is it important to our conversation? I would loop it back to what I said earlier about the sense of enoughness 
I feel like often the not enoughness is driven by a sense of running out of time and mm -hmm. therefore I need to A, B, C, and D. I think it's also relevant when we say to this younger generation, it's up to you to fix the crisis that we're in now. What? Why? That's, that's very built on a, an idea of time and generations. We have to work with this cathedral mindset of time that what we're doing today is going to take root and spread in complex ways, as Nora described, un un unfolding in many dimensions that we won't be around to see. Does that mean we don't do anything? Does that mean we say it's the younger generation's duty? We participate fully, knowing that we're part of something that's quite mysterious and will continue to unfold in ways that we don't know. And that's also really important for not burning out and also not taking shortcuts in order to see changes that we'll see in a four-year policy timeframe, even though we know what they're not what needs to happen. So I think this, this question of time could be an interesting conversation for a whole webinar of its own. But, but thank you for bringing it up and, and thank you to Mampella for raising that question. Thank you, Julia. I mean, uh, of course, uh, the year, 2022 will end at some point. I mean, not so far, not so far away from where we are. And, um, but we will not stop. I mean, and the 50th anniversary of both the limits to growth and the steps to an ecology of mind was the excuse for this webinar, but this is not the end of anything. This is more a, a step maybe to an ecology of mind, maybe an additional step to an ecology of mind. So we will continue. Of course, there have been many interesting um, comments, reflections, and questions in the chat that we have not addressed. Um, but we will continue digging into these possibilities, you know, of uh, holding also the role of the Club of Rome as a space where these conversations can take place. Also with people, not only from the domain of thinking, although thinking is crucial, I also quote Nora when she says that uh, the most practical thing that we can do is to change the way we think. But people are doing that on the ground as well. And we, in the Club of Rome, in the Emerging New Civilization Initiative and the, and the fifth element program, we are looking very much at that, at what people are doing, at what is, even, what is emerging from mm -hmm. the people, from the local communities. Very much along the ideas of a gentleman who is completely forgotten, but was one of the co-founders of the Club of Rome, Eric Jansch, who wrote this fascinating book, uh, The Self-Organizing Universe in 1980. Among the many forgotten people, especially women who have been weaving the history of uh, systems thinking and the uh, dedicated limits and beyond to, to Donella Meadows and Lynn Margulis. Mm -hmm. So another day we will talk about Lynn Margulis, you know, another forgotten uh, woman and leading uh, systems thinker. But uh, for these uh, morning, afternoon, evening, I, I, think, uh, I think we had a fantastic time, a fantastic conversation. So many thanks to all of you, to the attendants, to the speakers, and particularly to Julia and to Nora uh, for being with us and for the, the joy you gave to all of us. Thank you so much. And Thank you. Yeah, goodbye and take care and enjoy. Thank you so much. It was really nice to be with you, Julia, again. And Carlos, here. it's always fun. Same here. Someday, perhaps over an actual cup of tea. Imagine. <laughs> oh.